Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. We'll start the um, presentations at the top of the hour at 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock Pacific time. So we'll be back soon. All right. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, NOAA and the 2020 Western Wildfires from Forecasting to Impacts. I'm Aja Shamillo. I'm the NOAA West Regional Coordinator. Our presentations today feature staff from various NOAA line offices and NOAA adjacent offices in the Western region, all doing a range of important work to forecast and respond to this year's wildfires. We hope you learn something new about your colleagues and about NOAA's functions today. I'll briefly note this presentation is hosted by the NOAA West Regional Collaboration Team, which is one of eight regional teams that form the NOAA Regional Collaboration Network. The regional teams are groups of employees from NOAA line and staff offices and NOAA adjacent offices within each region that facilitate multidisciplinary projects to address regional priorities and share information and mobilize capabilities across the agency and throughout the country. The teams also engage regional stakeholders to address NOAA mission priorities, address distinct regional challenges related to NOAA's mission, leverage current and emerging regional partnerships to respond to stakeholder needs, and enhance NOAA's value and impact to its regions. We've scheduled an hour and a half for the presentations today, and each presentation is roughly 10 minutes long. And we've grouped the six presentations into three segments, and we'll pause after each set of two presentations for 10 minutes to answer questions. Please type your questions in the question and answer area in the control panel. And if you'd like, please offer your name, line office and duty station and your or your home organization if you're not from inside of NOAA, along with the question. Our first presentation today is practical. Many of you live in areas affected by wildfires or other natural disasters, and we decided it was an important opportunity to remind you how to plan for your personal safety before these events. I'm pleased to introduce Troy Nicolini, meteorologist in charge at the Eureka, California Weather Forecast Office, who will present on family preparedness for wildfires. Troy? Thank you. Okay, um, next slide, please. 
So wildfire preparedness is a, a broad topic. And if you forget everything else I say in the next 10 minutes, remember these two priorities. These are key to keeping your family safe. Make and practice a plan and ensure you know how to get notified about wildfire. All right, and I'll mention those at the end as well. Next slide. Seems like an obvious statement, but it seems like the wildfire hazard is really changing uh, in recent years. And I think the picture really captures it. This looks like a regular suburban neighborhood and the houses were destroyed by wildfire with um, housing moving into the forested area and, and the ability of embers to travel great distances on the wind. These homes that by all appearances were not subject to wildfire hazard were obviously destroyed by wildfire. And um, the statistics, even for our agency, shows that, that the impact is growing. We just did a data call. We're not sure if this is all of the, the cases, but at least 26 NOAA staff were um, had under mandatory evacuations in just those last fire season. And of course, thousands of NOAA staff were impacted by smoke. And many, many folks within our agency have stories of family and friends who lost homes or were also evacuated and impacted. Next slide. So as we talk about wildfire preparedness, uh, there's three scales you can think about it. One is protecting your home, so defensible space and hardening your home. This is a great example where it worked. It doesn't always work, I should point out. Uh, this is a, a very uh, interesting topic to me personally as a civil engineer, um, but um, you know, I'm not gonna focus on that now because of our time constraints. Also the community scale, there's a lot you can do to help improve the preparedness of your entire community. And again, a very interesting topic. I spent much of my weather service career working on community scale planning efforts, but I'm gonna prioritize the family scale planning. So for these other two topics, we're gonna have information at the NOAA West Google site that you can uh, access after this talk if you want more information on those topics. So I wanna focus on family planning because I have a time constraint, but I'll tell you it's actually, in, in reality, most folks do not spend very much time on preparedness activities. It's just a reality. If we were all in the same room right now and I asked for a show of hands of everybody who could say with, with all honesty that they felt like their family was completely prepared, they, they had a plan, they had evacuation routes, they had practiced them, they had go kits that they replenished frequently, probably only one in 10 people would raise their hand. So, you know, there's an issue with all of us are busy, it's hard to find time to do these preparedness activities. And so if you have a small increment of time, focus on your family scale planning first and worry about your home and your community second. Um, now, interestingly, most of the literature you'll find when you Google preparedness, whether it's wildfire preparedness or others, will start off with your house and community scale and then get to family preparedness. And I'm suggesting to invert that and make your family preparedness your highest priority. Next slide. And again, with only 10 minutes, I can't, I can't go through all the things you should do to make sure your family is prepared. So my goal is to help you get in the right state of mind to get your family prepared. There, um, go back up, please. Sorry. So um, even when you drill down to just making sure that your family is ready for wildfire or other hazards, there is so much information out there and it can get in the way of your objective. And your objective is to ensure that your family has a solid plan, that you've practiced it, and that you've developed muscle memory for your entire family to do the right thing during an emergency. And it's very achievable, but there's lots of things to get in the way of that good muscle memory for what you wanna do. And that picture of a gas meter to me is symbolic of all the stuff that can get in your way. And I'll just tell you why. If you read about what to do after an earthquake, you'll find, on the, you'll find information that tells you to turn off your gas after an earthquake. Um, also, if you read about what to do as you're evacuating your house during a wildfire, you'll see a mention of turning off a gas meter before you leave. And while there are scenarios where that's the right thing to do, I would, I would offer that you really wanna make sure that you don't develop muscle memory that slows you down. And so as a challenge to all of you, chat out right now to the group, if you think you can lay your hands on a crescent wrench within 30 seconds of right now. If you're at home, most folks are teleworking, I'm guessing. So go ahead and let us know if you think you can get your hand on a crescent wrench in, in 30 seconds from this moment. I'm guessing very few folks could find it. They dig through their toolbox, their cupboard, they go out to their, their car possibly. So just imagine in a short fused emergency environment, if you can't find the crescent wrench, you do not want to spend time digging around looking for a crescent wrench when you should be getting your family out the door. So the, to me, that, that gas meter is a great symbol of making sure that you stay focused on the highest priority, which is good muscle, muscle memory to do the right thing during an emergency. 
Um, I'll also mention, by the way, most gas meters don't get turned off very often. And so they're often very hard to turn off. And secondly, I really believe in practice. I think drills and practice for your family is one of the most important tools you can do for preparedness. And it turns out in most areas, it's illegal to turn off your gas yourself. You're supposed to have a gas company do it. So it's an activity that it turns out it's very hard to practice anyway. And you might be surprised how big of a crescent wrench you need to actually be able to turn off your gas meter if you were to do it. And I guess I've now admitted that I have illegally turned off my gas meter in the past to do work on my house. All right, next slide. So here's some cornerstones of your family preparedness. The bottom right shows just a map and evacuation route. It's super important to establish where you're gonna go and how you're gonna get out of your house in an emergency. And, and also to have multiple routes in particular for wildfire. It's not true for other hazards necessarily, for tsunami, for example, but for wildfire, it's very true. And then to practice those routes. And the practice is so important. And the practice should be a positive, non-scary experience for your family. It, everything you do for preparedness should be positive and um, fun and not scary. It's very important if you want your family to engage. So, for example, once you've established you know, how you're going to get out of your house and where you're going to go, you can make it a, a fun activity. So tell your family, hey, let's let's go out to dinner and let's let's treat it like a drill. Everybody, climb in bed like you're like you're in bed, and then let's uh, let's I'm gonna paint, bang this pot with a spoon, and let's all get to the front door and it, get in our car and evacuate like we're leaving the neighborhood for wildfire. And we can time ourselves, and you could throw some challenges in it if you want to make it fun. You know, whoever gets dressed into the door first gets to choose where you go to dinner. For example, whatever you can do to make it lighthearted, fun. Uh, and so that your family wants to do more and that they're not scared and don't want to do it in the future. Second part is sort of just the logistics of evacuating. So the upper left-hand image, that's actually my boy. He's got our go kit. He's got our dog on a leash. If you have cats, you've got to have, think about cat carriers and possibly how hard it is to get your cat in the cat carrier. My wife's cats took about an hour to coax into a cat carry, carrier to go to the veterinarian. So that's obviously something to consider. Um, I want you to notice that my son has a smile on his face. It's really important that as you're doing all these activities that you make sure that everybody is enjoying them and having fun and not um, being driven by fear. And there's lots of little logistics that you need to sort out. Everyone's house and situation and setting is different. And it's just really important to sort of mentally go through and think about the situations that you might confront and develop solutions for your family and then practice those solutions. I'll just give one little example for myself. I don't live in the wildfire hazard area but, I, area, but I do live in a tsunami hazard zone. And so we actually get to practice our evacuation drill pretty frequently. Whenever there's an earthquake, we practice our evacuation drill. And one thing I've given some thought to is the reality that um, earthquakes can take out power lines so that we might be evacuating in the dark. I mean, it turns out that's very true of wildfires as well. Um, one of the main ignition sources of wildfires recently has been down power lines. So you could need to evacuate uh, in your home at nighttime with no electricity for lighting. So as I've walked through that scenario in my own mind for my own situation, my initial solution was a headlamp. So I had one of these sitting by my bed because I envisioned it'd be great. I could just snap this on, turn it on, and then I could go about finding my shoes and my clothes and getting dressed in the dark and helping my family get out to evacuate. So that's an example of a solution. But um, I noticed over the years that this thing is just so darn handy that it kept getting borrowed and not left on the, the hook, the key hook that it's supposed to be on for emergency use only, which troubled me. And so I came up with a second solution. I stumbled onto these things right here, and you can see the problem. This is a night light that plugs into an outlet. I love these things. It's a rechargeable LED um, night light. So when it gets dark, if I cover the sensor, you'll see the light goes on, right? So it turns on at nighttime. And you'll notice it's not plugged in, so it doesn't require electricity to go on at nighttime. So if there's a power outage and it's not at night, these will stay on. And I have these peppered all around my house. It's almost like the lighting on an airplane that will guide our way to the exit. And then an added really cool feature is that as you go out of the house, you can grab these things and put them in your pocket, fold these little prongs down, and then it becomes a flashlight. So fantastic little way to make sure that you can get out of your house at the nighttime. Uh, and it, you know, engage with your family in these kinds of things and, and figure out solutions that works for you and your family and practice them and make it a fun experience. Um, the last part, the bottom left-hand corner is a, it's just like a written family plan with communication in particular, outside contacts that you can all reach in case you're not in the same place when this happens, uh, that, that can really reduce the stress during a real event. Okay, next, next slide. 
Another really important component of your family planning is to make sure that you'll be notified if there is a wildfire impacting your area. There's lots of technology these days. There's some old school technology technology that's been around for decades and there's some very new evolving technology. Um, it's a very interesting topic as well. Um, but what I'm gonna do is provide a great guide for making sure that you're gonna be notified during a wildfire and other hazards. And I'll make that available on the Google website so you can go there and get that sheet and use that to sign up for notifications. Next slide. But I wanna reiterate, the reason why it's so important to develop that muscle memory for your family so that folks, your family can, can evacuate safely and calmly without fear is, to, is because you're building your plan for the scenario where you have very little time to get out. In the perfect scenario, there's lots of notification, but you can't count on that. Uh, my brother-in-law lost his, fam his, his family's home in the 2017 fire in Santa Rosa, and he was awoken by a um, popping noise and a glowing orange light out of his window. So that's how much notice he had. And so it's, it's key to keep that in mind that make sure your, your evacuation plan and your muscle memory and your practice sessions are designed around very short notification. And that's why, for example, don't let that gas meter get in your way. Next slide. And so um, don't let anything get in your way. If it's time to go, the doubts can creep in. If you've practiced really well and practiced frequently, like say, for example, once a year, then those doubts will actually not be as big of a problem. But if they do creep up, avoid, avoid being a victim of the doubts and evacuate and evacuate as early as you possibly can. Next slide. So that's uh, hopefully will nudge you in the direction of getting your family moving towards a family plan and some exercises and practices that make it a positive experience. As you talk to your family about this, you may, you may get apathy from them. It's very natural. You know, if you come home and say, hey, I'm really charged up. I think we should do some stuff. And they say, well, I'm kind of busy. I don't really want to. Your natural tendency will be to try and scare them into taking this threat seriously so that they will work with you to get more prepared. It's a very natural tendency, but I wanna suggest that you resist that, that temptation. And here's why. There's an industry that tests out techniques of getting people to do things all the time. It's the advertising industry. And they have found that theater doesn't work very well. If it did work, this is how they would sell shampoo. They would say, if you don't use this shampoo, your hair will look like this. But what they know is that it doesn't work because people see that, that horrible hair when they're walking down the aisle and they choose not to buy that shampoo. But instead they say, your hair will look beautiful if you use our shampoo. And that way people want to buy the shampoo. So the next slide. So the way to look at this is positive family-based exercises and activities are sort of like the beautiful hair for preparedness. It helps make people want to do it. This is an evacuation drill. The guy in the background there is smiling. He's actually having a great time. This was done before the 2011 tsunami. During that tsunami, people said the real evacuation felt like a drill. They weren't afraid, they knew what to do, they had muscle memory, and it worked out really well. So that's what you want for your family, is to use uh, building a go kit, evacuation drills to all be positive things that they wanna do more, not less. Next slide. So I'll leave you with these two points and I would, I would challenge everyone on this call to think right now, get out a notepad or your smart device and add to your list of things to do, these two items. Make and practice a family plan, and make sure that you can be notified about wildfire. There'll be those links available for you to reference to go get more information. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Troy, I appreciate it. And I'll remind everyone, if you have questions for Troy, just please type them in the question box in the control panel. Um, we'll next move um, into our next presentation. So I'll introduce Tim Brown, who's the director of the Western Regional Climate Center, the Desert Research Institute in, Re in Reno, Nevada. And he'll present on value-added products based on NOAA predictive models. Um, and then we'll pause after Tim's presentation for questions for Troy and Tim. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. All right, thank you, Aja, and, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, you probably already know that this past year was a very extreme year for wildfire in California for lots of reasons. And one of those being uh, there was a tremendous amount of smoke this year that impacted a lot of things. Uh, the smoke uh, went far. It was 
seen in the East Coast. It actually traveled around uh, the world. And, but it had not only human health impacts, but it had firefighting operation impacts. So in the next slide, um, there we go. We see, uh, we see lots of smoke uh, produced by extensive uh, fire activity. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I have to apologize. This is a picture of smoke in Australia in January. Could we see one for California? That'll be the next slide. Oh, there we go. All right. So at uh, throughout much of August and September and even into October, there was many as two dozen extreme wildfires taking place uh, across the state. And as part of suppression activities, air operations is a is a major uh, part of that. And these are the tankers and, and the helicopters that support um, the, the ground crew operations. So the next slide, uh, just a classic kind of picture of a large aircraft doing a uh, retardant dump. This is indeed one of the larger aircraft. Uh, they come in, in numerous sizes. But these aircraft are, are stationed around um, the country, actually. But in the case we're going to talk about California, you know, they're positioned around the state. And then they're responding to the requests of the incident command team and uh, to, to support the suppression activities. So in the next slide, um, there was an area command team that got put together uh, for all these fires, and there was some discussion about, well, there could be impacts on the aircraft operations because there's so much smoke. So not unlike uh, typical aviation, uh, commercial aviation, uh, if visibility gets reduced, depending on the type of aircraft, that is not conditions that you can easily fly in. And certainly, if you're trying to put a retardant dump or a water dump around a fire, you really need to have good visibility and see uh, what your target is and, and make sure that all the safety protocols are in place. So a prototype decision support tool uh, was developed and experimented a bit, and this included um, tracking ongoing use of limited assets. But the main part that in uh, where I got involved had to do with, could we take some NOAA forecast model that are used uh, for forecast guidance and uh, use that as a decision support for the aircraft operations? So in the next slide, this is uh, an example of, of what we're thinking about, which is, uh, and, and there was a group of folks involved with this, but this is basically the, the idea, and so let's pretend this is a, a, a real event. So here you see um, southern, central Southern California and the different tankers and aircraft that are positioned around the state at these locations. The smoke forecast models are showing these areas of, say, uh, the, the purple and the red, which in this case would highlight very reduced visibility. So this is smoke uh, coming from all these wildfires scattered around the state. And now the question is, you want to use these aircraft in the suppression operation, but if the smoke and the visibility is, is so bad, that's really going to inhibit the use of, of those activities. And so one of the questions is, if you cannot use the aircraft, say, in one particular location, can you position it to another location and at least take advantage, you know, on another fire? Because these aircraft can be moved around uh, pretty quickly uh, across the state or across the region as needed. So on the next slide, Um, after discussion, well, what product, what NOAA product might serve this best, it was decided that 
one called the high resolution rapid refresh forecast model could uh, do very well. It is an experimental model with NOAA, but it has many of the uh, forecast elements that are of interest to fire. And in particular, uh, they do a forecast of something called PM 2.5, which is the smoke concentration uh, from uh, of wildfire and, and biomass burning. The image I'm showing you here is is simply temperature and winds. So these are this is the kind of forecast information that would help guide um, you know, what your of course your weather service official forecasts are, um, what TV weather forecasts uh, might be. So these are very commonly used guidance products. So in our specific case for fire, in the next slide, this will be a a bit of an animation. So here's a forecast period showing this uh, PM 2.5 smoke concentration uh, around uh, and actually how it's crossing uh, across the whole US, but it's originating uh, there in California. So the idea is to take this information and convert it into a, a visibility product that could be used uh, directly for uh, in support of, of the aviation activities. There's also a visibility product that does come out of the, of the HER, um, and so that was available as well. So the one that we developed is in the next uh, uh, shot here, which is basically what we did then is take that PM 2.5 and use, use a, a very simple equation that was derived uh, to, to actually try and get at if you have a certain amount of concentration from smoke what that might mean in terms of surface visibility. Now we also did this not just for the surface but for a thousand foot and six thousand foot uh, since obviously you have aircraft uh, flying around those altitudes um, around the fire incident. So basically the color scale here represents a forecast uh, visibility uh, that darkest purple is um, is uh, less than a mile. And of course, that's the kind of visibility that, that could definitely uh, and potentially impact uh, operations. Uh, even the one to three miles uh, could uh, have some, some limitations into the operations. And in this particular forecast, uh, this is showing at least four, uh, well, five fires actually that are reducing visibility uh, around the region. So we first started out by just making simple maps of these and this particular product was really uh, co-produced with people using it uh, and folks at uh, Predictive Services and um, it was also decided that well you could have very basic maps uh, that you could post but really you need a layer to put on top of say something like Google Earth to help you identify where that smoke is in relation to important geographic uh, references. So that's uh, basically the essence of, of what we did for, uh, for this particular effort. But there were, uh, as I said earlier, there was a lot of other uh, smoke interests as well. So in, in the next slide, um, we use a lot of other NOAA forecast guidance products uh, to produce information about smoke. And here's an example in, in California, Nevada, for example, we take NOAA's North American mesoscale model, and that's used to initialize a localized uh, mesoscale model called the Weather Research and Forecast Model. We run that twice daily. The meteorology of that is sent to the U.S. Forest Service uh, air fire team uh, at the Pacific Northwest Lab in Seattle, and they run something called the Blue Sky Modeling Framework. And so here's an example map um, where you see fires. These are all um, current fires, hotspot locations, and the gray, uh, gray areas uh, show smoke. So this is one one example of a uh, smoke uh, forecast product based on NOAA forecast guidance. In the next um, 
um, slide. So another thing that was brought up this year in response to all these fires, um, the Forest Service uh, runs the uh, Interagency of Wildland Fire Air Quality Response Program. And so again, uh, WARF was used uh, to do some specialized runs of air quality indices. So the uh, all these different uh, variables that you see there on the left uh, indicate different um, tools or, or and maps that folks will use in assessing air quality. And one group in particular that this product is aimed for is uh, air resource advisors. And they are um, a group of folks that tries to pull together, well not tries, they, they do pull together lots of smoke information during an incident. And they are uh, typically assigned to these larger incidents uh, much in the same way that an incident meteorologist is or fire behavior analysis analyst is um, with an incident command team. So lots of data and products and information was being provided and spun up, a lot of this in experimental mode. And, but, you know, we've learned a lot of things from this and, and we expect that this will be used extensively uh, in the future. And I think there was one more slide. Uh, yeah, just to show uh, some sample sample products. A lot of red on this, and, and maybe we do that just to get people's attention and and warn. But actually, the, the red in these particular products do indicate that these would be areas of um, a potential smoke impact. So the, the color scales are, are meant to, to associate with uh, potential risk. And I think that's it, maybe one more, but that's just my closing closing slide, my postcard from Reno, Nevada. So thanks very much. Thank you, Tim. So we've hit our first 10 minute break for questions and I see a few questions that have come in. Um, I'm wondering if um, Tim and Troy can come back on camera and Megan it might help you come on camera too. So run through questions. And then I'll put yes. them around for 10 minutes and I'll cut you guys off. <laughs> it looks like um, we had a question. What was the visibility, this is for Tim, what was the visibility algorithm that you used to calculate visibility from the PM 2.5 forecast? Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, I got it in my, oh, I might have to look it up exactly again, because I think I'm forgetting it at the moment, but it is a very, it's a very simple algorithm. Um, if you can give me a minute and go on to the next question, I can probably find that quickly. All right, we have one more question so far. Have reduced commercial flights reduced the ability to collect data needed for these visibility models this year? Oh, is that for me as well? Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm not aware of, of the utilization of any of the, the data for, from the flights other than as they um, observe uh, or as they make measurements during the flights, that information is transmitted to the ground and it does get assimilated into the models and to the forecast models. And so from that perspective, uh, those data get used, but it's not, there's not anything in there specifically uh, for um, the visibility itself. All right, we have a couple more questions trickling in for you, Tim. Could you tell us what observations are used to initialize the HRRR smoke run? Are these satellite-based measurements or are they ground-based PM 2.5 monitors? As far as I know, both uh, both get utilized, but the it's it's more about the gr the ground 
um, because the satellite, even though you have a, a sense of where the smoke is, you don't um, know the optical depth depth of that. Now there is a, a a satellite or two that does do optical depth, but those are not geostationary, and so you only get uh, that information when the satellites pass overhead. And the last question so far was NOAA forecast guidance product used for airnow.gov. Um, I'm not sure exactly about that one. What um, what gets used there? Now, um, NOAA also has a set of their own uh, air quality forecasts where they run the, something called the high split model. So, so NOAA is producing air quality forecasts uh, themselves, but as far as uh, air, air now, I've really only looked at air now in terms of the observation monitoring network that, that they support. A follow-up question for you, where can the public obtain information um, from NOAA? Uh, regarding regarding uh, smoke models, visibility modeling. Um, so if you googled the HRRR model, uh, you uh, you would find a matrix um, that shows all these these forecast products. You know, and another reason that her was was used is because it's a rapid refresh. That model gets run every hour. And uh, because of that, then it's it's more responsive to you know local conditions. And, and a lot of these fires change very rapidly. So where you can, you, you want to be able to use uh, just the most recent uh, data and forecast model information uh, that's possible. But I mean, I don't have the links, you know, right in my head that, that I could uh, say. So uh, I guess the best bet would just be, yeah, Google uh, NOAA air, air quality. I can add them to the Google site afterwards, um, after the presentation when we post this online. Okay, good. And maybe uh, we could, uh, I'll get you that little equation that was asked about before, and, and we can put that there as well. Sounds good. Those are all the questions I see right now. Troy, we did have a couple of responses to your question about how many people can access a crescent wrench in 30 seconds. And uh, we got a couple of yeses and we also got several no's. Um, and one person said I could find one in 90 seconds, but not 30 seconds. All right, great, thanks. Um, and a couple other questions uh, just came in. The uh, HRRR website does not present information that the public can understand very well. Are there plans for taking that information and uh, making it more understandable for the public? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question, and, and that's it's true. I mean, even the stuff that we were doing was really aimed at um, a group of, of users who knew knew the products, you know, well. So uh, a lot of these model forecast uh, things, there, there's a lot of them out there on, on the web available to look at, but they do require some some basic understanding, right, about what goes into them and, and how to interpret them. So specifically, I'm not sure, you know, say on the her. I mean, that would uh, that would be for that group to say if they have any kind of plans uh, for that. I know. I mean, the Weather Service obviously does put out a lot of products that are aimed at the public, uh, but it could be that some of these more fire things or the smoke things we might not be quite there yet. Uh, for those to be quite so public friendly. Yeah, 
Thank you, Tim. We have another question for Troy. Who makes the rechargeable LED light that you showed? This one's made by um, Energizer, but there's lots of makers of them. You can either Google Google them and get them online, or um, you know, go to your favorite local hardware store. And uh, this question could be for for either of you. Based on the devastating wildfire experiences over the last several years, is the National Weather Service doing anything different in terms of risk communication with regard to fire danger to reach traditionally underserved communities? Yeah, that, that, I can take a stab at that. that. That's a great question. You know, not that long ago, wildfire was thought of as a significant source of property damages, but did not um, result in the kinds of fatalities we've seen in recent events. And so the National Weather Service doesn't really originate a, a preparedness and awareness information about wildfire. It's sort of slightly out of our lane, but we are we really um, help to amplify the message from our partner agencies. And then we fold it into all of our multi-hazard uh, preparedness work we do with communities. And so especially communities that are particularly vulnerable and traditionally um, underserved in this regard, for us, that's native communities in this region. So we do do targeted uh, work uh, with those communities. Some of the big impacts have been, for example, smoke impacts to the elderly in the uh, tribal communities in the rural parts of the, the region. So we've had a lot of work with those communities to make sure that they're getting the information they need and the resources they need to solve those problems. Those are all the questions that I have, Asa. Great, and we're a little bit under time, so I think that's an excellent time to stop. Um, thank you, Troy and Tim. And we'll, um, if you have other questions for Troy and Tim, you can feel free to add them to um, the question box for later, and we can bring them back up, hopefully, if you guys are planning to stick around. But um, at this point, we'll um, return to presentations, and we'll uh, start with Scott Carpenter. So he is the Regional Response and Preparedness Special Specialist and Incident Meteorologist at the National Weather Service Western Regional Headquarters in Salt Lake City, Utah. And Scott's going to present on incident meteorology during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Scott. All right, thank you. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Megan. All right, so um, the map here shows the Western continental United States and each of those black shapes on that map represent wildland fire perimeters, which have occurred just this year. That's roughly 8 million acres that have burned, which is about 2 million acres more than the current 10 year average. Now, a motto of the incident meteorologists or IMETs is quote unquote, chasing perfection to catch excellence, which is paraphrased from coach Vince Lombardi years ago. I mentioned this because preparation for a busy year like this began actually a long time ago as extensive in-person and remote IMET training opportunities were developed. And preparation was really in the minds of everybody involved this year too in early 2020 as the pandemic developed with an above average fire season that we expected. A group of IMETs worked to develop guidance to ensure that the IMETs were ready to adapt to situations they might encounter during the upcoming season due to COVID. Questions had to be asked, like which of the IMETs are going to be comfortable deploying on site to the crowded incident command post? And how much of what an IMET provides could be provided remotely from an office or a location nearby and not co located with the incident command post? Those are things we thought about as we came into the season. Now, we'll talk here mostly about the IMETs, but it's very important to also highlight the whole office support for fire weather efforts from the assistance with IT equipment that IMETs use in the field to the extensive administrative work that occurs with the reimbursable agreements with state and federal agencies. And really many of the fires on this map are handled by the local weather forecast offices and never reach the point of needing, are handled by the local fire units, excuse me, and never reach the point of needing support of, by an incident meteorologist. But this does not mean that those fire crews fighting those fires are not receiving weather support. You can click to the next slide. Now, National Weather Service meteorologists are all trained to provide site-specific forecasts from the office during the initial attack periods of these fires. Some of these situations rapidly evolve, going from a single heat pixel on a satellite image 
to devastating conflagrations in only minutes to a few hours. It's often at these times that many others at the National Weather Service are providing the critical weather support as evacuation decisions are being made by local law enforcement agencies. Now the photos here represent a few examples of extreme fire situations during some large fire growth days where an incident meteorologist was not yet on scene. The photo on the left is of a fire-induced tornado on the Loyalton Fire in Northern California from August 16th. And this event led to the first known tornado warning being issued for a fire-induced tornado from our local office there in Reno, Nevada. And the photo on the right shows extensive tree damage that occurred when another fire-induced tornado occurred on the Creek Fire in California when it rapidly expanded over the Labor Day weekend. Events like these, as with all fires, are dependent on weather, topography, and fuels. Now, while topography remains a constant and fuels are very slow to change, weather is that, is that most variable aspect of the fire behavior triangle. This is why weather support is considered so important. Now, when a wildfire exceeds the capabilities of the local resources, the local fire, uh, fire resources, larger incident management teams will be called in and an IMET can be requested to be on site. The main role of that IMET is to provide weather forecast information in support of the firefighter efforts to maintain both firefighter and public safety. Much of this is accomplished working with the team's fire behavior analyst who takes the weather information and makes forecasts or projections regarding what the crews can expect to see when they're out on the actual fire line. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So what did that look like for this record breaking year? The upper left plot shows just how many IMETs were deployed on any given day this year from June 1st onward with dates going from left to right. The black line shows the 2020 data and the red line shows the previous record amount of IMETs out each day. The plot in the lower right shows the cumulative number of IMET deployments from June 1st onward, again with dates increasing from left to right. The green lines on each plot show the averages since 1991, and the green shading represents one standard deviation, or it's a gauge to show how far this year is from an average year. Thus far, we've had 185 deployments, and 67 of our 80 IMETs across the country have been deployed. The average distance traveled to an incident has been a little over 600 miles. IMETs have been on average excuse me, IMETs have on average been on site for just about, excuse me, within about 14 hours after the request was received for them to come. These are significant numbers when you consider that about 30% of those IMETs supporting the fires in the West this year came from our Central, Southern, Eastern, Alaska, and even Pacific region. You can go to the next slide. For those who might ask what we take to an incident as an IMET, for these roughly 14 day deployments. This year, the average has been 12 days for each deployment. These photos show just a glimpse of all the equipment that gets toted along as an IMET deploys. If you can click once, Megan, imagine packing all this gear if you had to fly to an assignment. And this year, that the equipment also had to include 72 hours of food and water because the IMETs were instructed to be that self-sufficient upon arrival due to potential COVID limitations. You can go to the next slide. Next, I thought you might enjoy hearing what a typical day looks like for an IMET. Up in the morning in time to be ready to brief the operations section staff by around 5.30 a.m. and then to brief the entire command post by usually around 6 a.m. So that may mean crawling out of your tent really early or it could mean getting up even earlier for an hour's drive from a hotel for some of the fires in California. The command post where we work may be in a school building, on a fairgrounds, or an open field with yurts or trailers as our workspace. Um, many of the briefings that are also provided, they can also be provided by radio to many of the firefighters who are camped out at other locations around the fire. And oftentimes the IMET will also travel to nearby helicopter bases to provide morning aviation specific briefings to those aiding the firefighters from above. Now, after the morning briefings, a lot, of the a lot of coordination occurs with the local forecast offices. So we have that common picture. And additionally, there may be meetings with local officials or politicians, perhaps an interview with the media, and even an opportunity to launch a weather balloon to get extra data on the atmospheric conditions. 
Often then the IMET and the fire behavior analysts will travel out to the fire line during the day to get, a lay, get the lay of the land and sort of observe how the winds are being impacted by details of the terrain and to interact with the operations personnel. Because those folks are always considering the weather impacts to their planned operations for the day. There can be a need for the firefighters to purposefully burn off additional areas to create areas of burn fuel in hopes that it will stop an approaching wildfire. So, and obviously anytime additional fire is introduced to the wildfire environment, the team really wants to be confident that the winds and the weather will not create additional problems. So they really put their trust in the IMETs to provide that information. Now, later in the day, by late afternoon, the IMET's back at the command post preparing for the evening planning meetings where the plan for tomorrow is briefed to team leadership. There can be public meetings where weather briefings are included as well. The day often continues until around 10 p.m. as observations come in from those who have been out on the fire line all day. You fit in the day, lots of caffeine, time for breakfast, a sack lunch, dinner, and a little time for personal care, maybe even a shower in the portable shower units, and the day easily becomes 16 to 18 hours long. So you can go to the next slide. Now, how did, this, how did the pandemic change things this year? So just real quick, most of the IMET deployments have still been directly to the incident command post. A few IMETs were asked early on in the Southwest, especially to try to remain away from the command post and provide support from a nearby hotel. But limitations this placed on communication with those in the field about the evolving weather situations was a significant issue. It seemed overall that by the time the West Coast got more active in the season, most of the teams were implementing COVID safety precautions and kept many of the crews camped away from the command post, but otherwise operations proceeded relatively normally. As a result, many of the briefing settings looked like those shown here. If there was a crowd, social distancing was practiced and masks were absolutely required. Oftentimes the crowds for the briefings were much smaller and technology was used to transmit briefings to fire crews out closer to the fires. Go, uh, next slide. Some of the incident command posts or more spread out than usual to limit exposure. The incidents didn't roll out red carpet for everyone entering the incident command post, but there were some new red tents this year at many incidents. The one shown here is an example of the tents on the next one. Yep, there you go. The, is, these tents contain thermal imaging sensors to check all personnel frequently for potential fever conditions that might be a sign of COVID-19. If symptoms were present, the individuals were quarantined, treated, and tested and treated. Now, while, while some of the incidents did have COVID cases reported, the overwhelming opinion this year has been that precautions were extremely successful with much less observation of sick people around these crowded and smoky camp settings. Many have already been expressing that we hope the fire agencies continue these practices beyond the pandemic period. And I'll close by thanking Noah West for the invitation to be here today on behalf of the IMETs. And also thanks to the many IMETs who've shared their experiences and photos this season. And thank you for your time and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Scott, I appreciate that. Um, and we're gonna move right into our next presentation, um, which is Robin Heffernan and, um, from the National Fire Weather Science and Dissemination, or she is a National Fire Weather Science and Dissemination Meteorologist at the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. And Robin's going to present on critical incident stress. And she's got a few, um, few people to help out with her presentation as well, Christina Crow and Valerie Gardner. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Asia. So while well, Scott, painted a pretty good picture of some of the physical impacts of being an IMET this year. What I'm going to talk about is some of the emotional impacts of being an IMET um, in the National Weather Service. So we're going to talk about something called critical incident stress. We're going to go to the next slide. So we define a critical incident as really kind of a traumatic event that overwhelms your typical coping system a coping mechanism and really sends you into kind of a crisis response where you have this very powerful emotional and physical reaction. Next slide. And when you're in this type of situation, in this heightened um, emotional crisis situation, we call this critical incident stress. 
And this is something that has impacted many of our forecasters, particularly in the fire weather program, um, over the history of the program, but only in recent years, in the past five years or so, have we really been equipped as an agency to address it. And so when you're in this heightened state, I want to I want to express that not all individuals that experience the same event are going to have the same reaction to that event. Um, two forecasters can be on the same exact fire, experience the same thing and have different reactions to it. And there's no judgment to that. There's no emotional strength that's linked with this. It doesn't matter how much it's not about how much you care about what happened. It really has to do with your personal you know, brain connections of things that have happened in your history to what you're experiencing out there um, on the fire line. And you know, I can I can give an example of this from a personal experience of just being a parent and comparing how I reacted to news stories of things of children being impacted or hurt or injured um, prior to being a parent to now post, you know, having children myself and my own personal impact to that. And that's kind of how this critical incident stress works. We all react differently to it, and um, knowledge really is power. So if we want to go to the next slide. So the Critical Incident Stress Management Program called CISM really is based on that concept that knowledge is power, providing education to our folks that this is something that may impact you, um, that it's not necessarily something you can control, but it is something you can manage with education, being able to do a self-analysis, and, and that's what we kind of practice in resilience and recovery, being able to provide a self-analysis to know if you're having this type of impact and how to take care of yourself. And we provide resources so people know how to take care of themselves um, in this type of situation so that they can result in a faster recovery and going back to your normal coping mechanisms of everyday life. The bottom of the screen there, um, that's the National Interagency Fire Center Critical Incident Management Stress Program, which is what we kind of based our National Weather Service Program after. And they are really committed to peer support. So they provide education efforts, once again, to for folks to be able to do a self-assessment and knowledge. And then as far as the resources go, they provide a peer support program of a critical incident stress management team that will go out to these incidents where we've had fatalities or other sites sorts of traumatic events and be able to provide that peer support and, um, and help people cope with the situation. So on to the next, on to the next slide. So bringing it home to some of our impacts in the National Weather Service and some of our recent struggles with critical incident stress. Back in 2013, sadly, we all remember the Yarnell Hill fire and the 19 firefighters that perished on that incident. Then fast forwarding a few more years, we had the Camp Fire in 2018, another very impactful event with not only firefighter fatalities, but also significant numbers of civilian fatalities. And this, this event went on for several months and we had quite a few of our own personnel involved with this. And then even bringing it home into this year in 2020, we've had about 32 civilian fatalities so far associated with wildland fire and 73 firefighter fatalities so far this year. And that's not just kind of concentrated on any one particular event that's spread across all of the events that we've supported. And as Scott showed you on um, the previous presentation, 67 um, unique incident meteorologists have been out in the field dealing with these types, types of fatalities and near misses, burnovers, those types of things this year. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So what have we done as an agency and on Fire Weather Program to help our folks? Well, first in 2015, and this is kind of on the heels of the Yarnell Hill incident and the impacts of that in the wildland fire community, we started the National Weather Service Fire Weather Program to educate ourselves. Uh, we went out and took some education. I personally became certified as a peer supporter for this. And we began to have conversations within our program with our folks about the fact that this does occur and that many of our folks might have been or are being impacted by this program. By, by the situation and trying to assist with this program. And that's kind of a, a rough topic to bring up because it's a touchy-feely topic. And when people have been trained for years to cover this up and push it aside so they can do the mission, um, it's, it's a little bit hard to start that conversation. But once you do and people understand the comfort that can come from addressing these issues, it's very easy to continue this conversation going forward. And we've noticed through time that there is quite an appetite 
for having these conversations within the Fair Weather Program and the IMET ranks to be able to have healthy discussion and healing discussion for our folks. So beginning in 2016, we started to have annual training sessions. And during this time, we would have a volunteer incident meteorologist that was very brave and volunteered to be vulnerable in sharing their personal experience on an incident that they might have had with a very traumatic event, how it impacted them, and how they managed with it. And that's a great um, opener for everybody else to, to kind of relate to that situation and be able to really spur on a very um, engaging and healthy discussion. So we've done that ever since 2016. In 2017, we started to develop some formal resources on our IMIC Google Sites page, and we've posted them there. So there's a lot of resources our folks can go to to kind of see what impacts might look like for themselves, how they can do a self-assessment, and so on, those types of resources. And then beginning in 2018, we started to engage more of a formal effort where we developed a team of incident meteorologists and we have a protocol in which we respond to um, our folks out in the field when something um, traumatic happens, such as a burnover or a fatality or something of that nature in which we engage with that person, we reach out to them, let them know that they have a support team that they can reach out to, and then offer alternatives for them to be able to provide, to be able to be provided with their own um, emotional support while still being able to provide the weather support they need to for the incident. And that might look like bringing in another incident meteorologist or whatever they need, but we do have a protocol to be able to assess that so that we can provide both for the weather of the incident and we can provide for our people as well. And then in 2019, working with Christina, you see on your screen here, she's with the Office of the Chief Learning Officer and um, she really engaged in this program. And you know, this is, she realized, and as we all do, that this is beyond fire. This isn't just a fire issue. Um, the Critical Incident Stress Management Program at our agency might have started there because we adopted it from the wildland fire agencies and we saw that need there first. But Christina has expanded this program across the agency so that anybody impacted um, from traumatic events within our agency, which sadly is not uncommon due to our line of work, um, we have you know, numerous fatalities associated with tornadoes and hurricane events and severe weather. And Christina has helped broaden this program so that we have resources agency-wide to help our forecasters. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Christina. Thank you, Robin. And Megan, you can go to the next slide. Uh, as Robin mentioned, you know, the, the disaster experience is not something that's uh, only for fire weather. And so I, I came to this from working tornado events in the Southeast. And so when I arrived at the training center here in Kansas City in 2018, we started working with Robin to develop training. Um, you've got pictures there from two of our classes that we've started instituting this topic in our decision support services boot camp, which is for folks who may deploy for a variety of uh, hazardous weather or major events like the Super Bowl or something of that sort uh, for support on site at emergency operations centers. We also have the effective hurricane messaging class, which is taught down at our hurricane center. And we've done one with the Pacific region too, um, for really specifically dealing with hurricane scenarios and the types of stress that people will encounter by working those long-term events. We've also then, uh, in the last six months, brought on board um, Valerie Gardner, Lieutenant Commander Valerie Gardner, comes to us from the US Public Health Service, and she's gonna be helping us work on developing more programmatic support for overall behavioral health and well-being for our employees, and specifically working on this topic, and, and figuring out what we can do besides just having these kinds of individual training um, in our classes. And so with that, Valerie, if you would like to comment on anything you're planning to do um, from the headquarters perspective. And Valerie, I think you're muted. I am muted. Thank you, Robin and Christina. As Christina said, I National Weather brought me on not only to assist with program development and management, but to provide boots on the ground, clinical support and services, not only to IMET, but across National Weather Service. Um, as you've heard from the prior present presenters and now Robin and Christina, there's so much variability in demand um, in what National Weather Service um, team members do and provide on a 
24 hour basis. So I'm here to provide behavioral health services and support across uh, National Weather Service. I'm glad to be a part of the team. Not only will I be reaching out and have reached out to different offices and, and team members, but I'll also be providing individual support and consultation as needed and just here to um, guide and, and help with anything that is behavioral health related. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. We're excited to have your expertise. Thank you, Robin. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Thank all of you for that. Um, that was an excellent presentation. I'm wondering if Scott can come back on the screen as well. And um, so we'll do the same 10 minute break that we did a, um, a little while ago to answer any questions that you guys have about their presentations. Megan, I'm hoping you'll join us too. Yes, we have one question so far, and this is for Scott. Where can I obtain shapefile or other GIS data sets for the 2020 Western wildfires? Robin, you may also know the answer to this question. There, I'll take a shot first. I mean, there's several sites um, through the National Interagency Fire Center that have uh, the shapefiles publicly available. Uh, and there's also, um, there's just multiple different uh, places. Do you have any specifics to mention, Robin? I was gonna mention the GeoMAC site. If you if you uh, Google GeoMAC, G-E-O-M-A-C, they did um, have some technical, what do I wanna say, change over this year with regard to their server and addresses and stuff like that. So you'd wanna Google it for the most um, current link to that, but they have downloadable shape files available for that set. And again, I'll touch base with you guys afterwards to add those resources to the Google site for, um, for this presentation. And it looks like somebody posted a link to the NIFC fire perimeter link as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? So if not, in the interest of time, we'll roll into our final segment. Um, Thank all of you guys for presenting. And if you have questions for Scott or Valerie or Christina or Robin, um, please go ahead and add them and we can try to sweep through those at the very, very end. Um, and so now um, we'll move into our final segment. And this presentation is from Catherine Rowden, who um, is the hydrology program manager at the National Weather Service Western Regional Headquarters in Salt Lake City. And she'll present on debris flow. Thank you, Asia. Um, so I also, besides being the Western Region Hydrology Program Manager, lead the Weather Services post-fire working group trying to tackle these issues. And talking about flash floods and debris flows after fire, and we just shorthand say post-fire. So that's what I'm talking about when I say post-fire. Um, next slide. So just a little primer on what we're talking about. So this is a the Eniat Valley. It's on the east slopes of the Cascade Mountains in Washington. Beautiful, green, and lush. Um, go ahead and click. And then after the 2015 uh, Wolverine fire, uh, this is what that landscape looked like. So a raindrop that falls on the landscape pre-fire, it's intercepted by the tree canopy. Uh, as it flows across the ground, it's slowed down by all the ground cover. Well, in a lot of cases after fire, that's all gone or mostly gone, depending on how bad the fire was. So the, the runoff, we get more rain hitting the ground, it comes off faster, it picks up ash and sediment, which can change the density of flow and cause all kinds of problems. So a very different watershed response after the fire, um, leading to heightened debris flow and flash flood risk. Next slide. So a typical quote unquote uh, river flood, they, there's all kinds that can be very destructive, but this is an out of bank river flood that was in Spokane, Washington, just a regular, regular old flood. Next slide. 
And uh, what we see in the post-fire environment is more like this. We have, again, because of the density of the flow changes with all the sediment and ash, it, it floats thing, it will float things that don't normally float in a flash flood or river flood. Um, so, and especially in the upper left with debris flows, which are a, an entirely different physical phenomenon, more in the realm of landslides, they have non-Newtonian physics, they flow more like a concrete slurry, very destructive. Um, so you get boulders, you get things picked up from other people's uh, property, all kinds of things that come down in these events. And another piece that makes them especially challenging is they occur in areas that often don't typically see flooding. <clears throat> so they're impacting communities that aren't used to having to pay attention to these types of hazards in general. Next slide. So for the Weather Service side, our mission in this area is falls within our flash flood warning program. Uh, that's where we capture these post-fire flash flood debris flows is with our weather forecast for heavy rainfall and our watches and warnings for flash floods typically. Next slide. So where we get the information about the changed landscape and what might be at risk now is typically from the Forest Service and Depart Department of Interior Burned Area Emergency Response Teams or BEAR teams. So they go out as soon as they can, typically when the fire's at least 80% contained, although in the era of mega fires, that's changing a lot. But they'll go out, see how badly the landscape burned, um, what might be at risk downstream, do a lot of modeling and estimates and share that with the weather service and local stakeholders. And across the bottom, just for awareness, it's a low burn severity, moderate burn severity, and high severity. And it looks like the labels aren't, at least on my screen, showing up. But uh, the ones that really concern us is when you get a, a watershed that has a mix of moderate and high severity, you know, past a certain threshold of, you know, percent coverage in a watershed, uh, we can really start to expect problems. And the high severity on the right, all that ash and no vegetation, no canopy left is, are definitely, especially in areas of steep slopes, the most concerning um, that we deal with. Next slide. So another interesting phenomenon uh, that if you haven't been in a burned area is kind of unique and surprising is the, the soils can become water repellent if they get hot enough. I'll save the explanation for another presentation, but you can go out in a burned area and drop water on it and it's like Rain-X on your windshield. It feeds up, it does not infiltrate at all, it does not wet the soil. Um, if you download this later, there's a great link to a, a YouTube video our hydrologist in Boise did, it's very short. But now you have a landscape where the raindrops hit the soil, there's no canopy interception, there's no ground cover to slow the flow, and now the soils are also water repellent, so they just run off more like rain on pavement. Next slide. So this is a satellite imagery, pre-fire vegetation, post-fire vegetation, the difference between the two pre and post, the estimate of the fire intensity from that, and then the final soil burn severity map. And I show that just to show that we, we rely heavily on satellite estimates. There's a lot of pieces of NOAA that come into play in post-fire. Um, there's some, some work going on to test the new GOES satellites to see how well those can work. But um, for an early estimate of fire effects on the landscape, the satellite is really the place for it. And then they're field validated or ground truth by those bear teams to see how accurate they are. And it's that final validated soil burn severity map that goes into all kinds of modeling and again assessing what's at risk downstream from the changed landscape. Next slide. Uh, and one of the key products that we and the Weather Service depend on comes from the USGS Landslide Hazards Group. They have a debris flow, post-fire probability and volume model. Some areas with a lot of great research, our forecast offices can actually pull rainfall thresholds to use for warnings but that that level of science and research does not exist across the country so in other places we would just use this quantitatively for a risk assessment you know work use it for outreach it's a great outreach tool etc next slide uh, also within the weather service a lot of people don't know we do have a, a number a few uh, burned area emergency response hydrologists so like scott carpenter shared with imet program we deploy to um to incidents for you know 14 or plus day deployment, doing the field assessment on the landscape as well as the office report writing and whatnot. Next slide. 
Uh, we're also involved in trying to get the uh, emergency warning ring gauges placed on the landscape if needed. We have the image on the right is radar coverage across Washington and, and that area in the middle where you don't see the, the radar polygons is where a lot of the mega fires were in Washington. And those little pins were where um, uh, early warning rain gauges were placed. Fortunately, not every state is so lucky. Um, and that picture on the left is Andy Bryant. On the left there, a hydrologist from the Portland Weather Forecast Office getting a rain gauge out in the Eagle Creek fire from 2018. Next slide. We're also heavily involved in the public education outreach. Like I mentioned, it's for a lot of folks, it's a completely new phenomenon. They may not have even ever had flooding near their homes. And that's a really challenging social science and education piece, especially when people are so focused on the fire emergency, then we come in and try to tell them, now you also have a new threat for several years. And this is from a different presentation, but those pictures on the left are from wildfire public meetings and they're very packed. And the picture on the right in the upper right is from a post-fire meeting and you can see the difference in attendance. So trying to get out during the fire meetings has become a, a key effort uh, just because the audience is there. Most folks are too tired to come out for more meetings after the fire. Uh, it makes it a lot harder to reach them. Next slide. Uh, so with all of this, all the great data, fair team assessments, modeling, et cetera, um, the problem we're facing, especially as these fires burn longer and they're larger, is that we can get the rains and the floods before we have any assessment data and oftentimes now before the fires are even out. Next slide. So this is a classic example, the fire camp of Carlton Complex in 2014 flooded. That was a mega fire up there. The rains that put out the fire also um, actually nearly killed a firefighter in a, in a dam breach event. Next slide. Uh, firefighters in Washington last year on the left on the August 9th they were fighting the fire and on the 10th the rains came and washed out the roads and they actually had to be they had to helicopter some firefighters out who got stranded from that event next slide and then the most famous would be the Thomas fire that broke out in December 2017 and the fatal debris flows in Montecito were in January of 2018 Unfortunately, there was some assessment data, there was some good information um, before that event for public outreach, and there was still 23 fatalities in that event, and it was, the fire was not considered contained before that happened. Next slide. So this is just a smattering from a small portion in Washington from where I worked of events that happened before the fires were out, and my friend and colleague Annie Schmidt from the National Fire Learning Network, I think, summed it up the best as even in the most prepared communities with great resources, we are behind on life safety the moment the fire starts. And it is so true. We see it time and time again. It's, it's really challenging. Next slide. So what makes it even more challenging? So from the weather service side, an example from Pueblo, Colorado, WFO, uh, about 60% of their flash flood warnings last year were for three burn scars they have, even though they make up less than 1% of their county warning, warning area. So the the workload on the forecasters in the office can get pretty intense just monitoring these small areas. Next slide. And then additionally, uh, what I didn't mention about debris flows is that they are triggered from rainfall intensity, not rainfall amount. So the, the picture in the upper left was half an inch of rain in about 15 minutes. The lower two was half an inch in about an hour. And the, the results can be catastrophic from a very small, very short amount of rain, which is not what our standard traditional forecast um, forecasts are designed to, what our observations are designed to. So, um, and we're working on improving that, but it's, it's a very different environment than your typical flooding and flash flooding uh, regime. Next slide. So you add to that all the uncertainty, um, you know, how accurate is your rainfall forecast for precipitation on the order of 15 minutes? Um, how is the burn scar recovering from year to year? Do we even know what type of rain will cause a flash flood or debris flow in the first place? Because there's still a lot of science to do there. Um, if one does happen, how big will it be? What will it impact? You know, again, the landscape has changed overnight. So what, what happened last year is not going to happen now. <clears throat> and then on the social science aspect, if we do issue a warning, what will the public do with that? Do they even understand that it applies to them? Next slide. 
So all of that uncertainty does not take away the fact that we still have to issue a warning for these events, whether we have that information from the assessments or not, or whether we have confidence in the rainfall thresholds being suggested or not, we still have to issue those warnings and work with the public and do the best that we can. Next slide. Um, and again, just to, uh, just to emphasize the challenge, that Montecito event that I'm sure most have heard about that killed over 23 people or killed 23 people, uh, demolished, I think, over 400 homes. Um, that was what triggered it was half an inch of rain in five minutes and about and it was also an inch of rain in 15 minutes. So again, our, our traditional forecast observation tools um, are, are really, um, it, it's really difficult to depend on those in these types of events. Next slide. So, and I'll just wrap up with the social science aspect is really key in, in this world. Um, again, the landscape changes overnight. We're trying to educate people to their, their new reality. Uh, and, and we're not even certain of what that is often when we're doing the outreach um, that makes it very challenging. So this is a picture of that Montecito event and they did have evacuation orders in place. Many people didn't evacuate. Um, so there's the issue of overcoming evacuation fatigue if people had just recently been evacuated by the wildfire or do they even understand this outreach that's coming to them? Um, and that quote on the right is from a retired Forest Service bear hydrologist who, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes the message is just not to be there when it happens. Here it comes, get out of the way. And that's a, that's a really challenging message to convey to the public. Um, and in this case, with all the people that didn't evacuate and there were several fatalities, um, oftentimes we have a hard time because people are not familiar with the risk. You can go to the next slide. In Montecito itself, uh, this is something, well, there's more pictures, 2018, sorry, next slide. Uh, in Montecito, they, they have actually had this happen. Sorry, go back, there we go. They've actually had this type of event happen before. Um, the top left is 64, the bottom right is 1969. It happened again in the 90s. So even in a community with a direct history to post-fire flash floods and debris flows, they still were unable to overcome that, that social science um, leap of trying to get them to understand the new risk, get out ahead of the storm to protect their life and property. Um, next slide. And that's all I have. I just um, wanted to, to kind of shout out to all the partners in Post Fire. I, I've heard it said that Post Fire is where fire was about 20 years ago as far as research and tools and all this stuff. And so there's a lot of people, it's a pretty small community working really hard to, to move this forward and, and do better with the, the life safety issues. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and we'll, we'll move right into our next presentation, um, which is from Terry O'Rourke, who is the Oregon Coast Branch Chief at No Fisheries, um, West Coast Region in Rosenberg, or Roseburg, excuse me, Oregon. And she'll present on some of the biological impacts and regu regulatory implications of wildfires. All right, great, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, speak on this. Um, as we know, the fires have raged throughout the West and, oops, I think we're bumping through my slides there, it's okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to focus my talk on our experience here in Western Oregon this past year. And being that I'm the last speaker, I'm going to start with uh, inviting people who are interested in continuing this conversation afterwards. I'll just send that invitation for collaboration and support or information exchange and, and ask that you be in touch in the future. So just a really quick setting, it rains here. It rains here a lot. We have waterfalls and big rivers and big trees. And although fire, it has been part of the ecosystem, fire has been part of what has been happening in Western Oregon, this year was different. And over the last 20 years in Oregon, we've had mostly drought years. We've had some rainy years, but mostly drought years. And this year we had a significant wind event. And that wind event was extreme. We also had many human ignitions, whether it was deliberate or whether it was caused by human infrastructure. 
Also something that was very different this year was the um, change in the system during the fires. Usually firefighters count on nighttime temperatures reducing and humidity increasing. But this year during the fires, the nighttime temperatures stayed high and the humidity stayed low at night, which made getting ahead of the fires or fighting the fires extremely difficult and extremely dangerous. Also over the last few decades, the increase in urbanization and building in the forest has significantly increased. So species and fire effects. This year, we experienced something very different. In the past, wildland firefighting what happened on national forest lands, BLM lands, we, we knew what to expect. And although it was always difficult and it was always happening, this year was different. This year's fires were a combination of wildland firefighting and structural firefighting. And so this year's effect on species and the cleanup efforts really focused on hazardous material removal, toxic chemical issues, and that shift from immediate restoration to really focusing on structural fire cleanup. And so that too has an impact on the species because sedimentation has, is there, it's increasing. You just saw the presentation about debris flows and we're, you know, right as soon as the fires ended, the rains began. And so the sedimentation is beginning. So during the cleanup, there was sedimentation going in because the focus was not on getting seeds in there, it was on getting hazardous materials out and cleaning up the extreme uh, number of safety issues. Also, there was significant tree removal and other activities in the riparian areas right after the fires. And we have dead fish. Um, we have a, a number of um, power projects and screens are off due to the incredible amount of debris and also power loss. Um, next slide. So where do we come in? Regulatory, sounds ominous, but actually the Endangered Species Act, Magnuson-Stevens Act, um, gives us the opportunity to do work ahead of time during and after fires. So the Endangered Species Act is um, brought into play whenever any government agency needs to consult. And what we found over the years is the better the relationship with the government agency, the better the consultation and the better for the fish. So the majority of our consultations are done project by project before a project is begun, like one timber sale, one housing development, one liquid natural gas line. Um, and that's, that's standard for us. Emergency consultations, generally we get a call, people say, hey, it's an emergency, and we say, do what you need to do, talk to us later. And um, if we have good relationship with folks, if we've had interactions before the emergency, sometimes we've developed a list of things to do or guidelines that can be implemented during or after the fire. Um, but again, it depends on those pre-fire relationships. And then we also have programmatic consultations which is a big difference in this year's response. Um, programmatic consultations are broad scale program level coverage. So we have programmatic consultations for actions with federal agencies with the Corps of Engineers, uh, Housing and Urban Development, Federal Highways as implemented through Oregon Department of Transportation, FEMA and the federal land management agencies, BLM, Forest Service and others. So pre-fire, um, NIMS was addressing land management activities through forest plan um, relationships that had been built up over the years. We have uh, teams, level one and level two teams, where level one teams, which are the most important teams, are the biologists from NIMS and the biologists from federal land management agencies that act as peer review and interactions and just um, keeping all of the programs working together and, and resolving issues. And then level two is there for any <clears throat> issues that aren't resolved. But those relationships with those agency biologists have um, evolved over the years. They've become very positive and we've worked together on restoration projects, things like that. 
Um, all right, next slide. Yep, there's the obligatory Bambi picture, but there are fish in that river. So, whoops, back to the back to the Bambi slide. Thank you. All right. So our immediate response during the emergency was, um, oh, back to the Bambi slide. There we go. <laughs> our emergency response with the land management agency started out with the Forest Service um, reaching out to us saying, hey, we have an emergency and just kind of re-instituting those guidelines, those um, interactions that we've had with them in the past. And then during the fire, there were some critical issues that needed to be addressed. And so just being in touch with them throughout the fire season or throughout the fires and addressing emergency issues as they came up really, um, I think, spoke well for the relationships that had been built up over time. Also, we started working with some of the counties and state agencies and others who were fighting more of the structural wild, you know, structural slash wildland fires and providing information to folks. I think the biggest shift was regarding those structural fire issues. Wildland firefighting has been happening for years. There's incident command, there's um, people trained in this, but the level of fire fighting that was needed and the level of emergency response in those areas that weren't led by those um, land management agencies, they were really struggling. So with very limited experience and lots of turnover from previous years when incidences had occurred, they were looking for an understanding of the Endangered Species Act, what they had to do, how to consult, and they had a desire to do the right thing. They wanted to put things into contracts, get things going on the ground, but they didn't really have anything to cite. So um, we worked with them specifically on hazmat removal, toxic chemical removal, um, and then the safety tree removal and power restoration. And we began educating these other federal agencies, county, states about ESA requirements and processes. But we needed to also be out of the way. We didn't want to be bureaucratic. We wanted to just be of assistance. And so as they needed more information, we started pulling from our programmatic consultations. Next slide. So these programmatic consultations that were in place, in place offered the guidance. And so we cited, you know, tree removal, debris removal, um, restoration, things that are in different components under FEMA or the federal highways or some of our land management restoration programmatics. And we started leveraging these programmatics together so that uh, EPA and other agencies who didn't have programmatics with us could work with those agencies that did and be responsive to the fire. And next slide. Oops, let's go back to the fish. All right, now that the fires are out, um, restoration is beginning. Um, there's a higher level of coordination than I've ever seen um, by the state. Assessments are almost complete. We heard from Catherine in the previous um, presentation about the bear teams, the burned area emergency response teams on federal agencies. Well, the state, EPA, and others are working together to do that on private lands. So as the information from the bear teams and the private land assessments come together, there'll be a, a pulling together of that information and a prior prioritization. What we're finding right now is there's competition for scarce resources, for restoration resources for seeds, for seedlings, and for funding. So we anticipate in the next number of months, the prioritization process will begin as far as where to spend money, where to allocate those limited resources. And next slide. So post-fire questions. We're already getting pressure to um, do things differently. And so some of the fire questions that we're asking is, what role did riparian buffers have in mitigating fire effects? We have buffers that we ask from federal agencies when they do timber sales. Did they have any effect? Was it positive? Was it negative? Did variations in silvicultural prescriptions impact riparian areas? Sometimes they clear cut, sometimes they thin. Did it matter? 
And then what are the impacts of salmon, white abalone, and other species post-fire? And there'll be more and more questions. So the pressure has begun. People have already said these fires happen because the services, Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, National Marine Fisheries Service did not allow for timber harvesting. So the pressure to increase timber harvesting and increasing prescribed burning will be in our future. And then depending on how and where and when it's done, it could have impacts to the resources. So last slide, what's next? Uh, we'll be following up with the state regarding long-term restoration prioritization, learning from our programmatic use and addressing any voids, addressing the science questions and learning from this, and then looking at how conditions have changed. I mean, climate is changing, the impacts are already here, um, and if this is the new norm, then we need to address this. How we do that, I think this seminar is a good first way to start with interactions and education internally. And we're able to respond to emergencies based on existing positive relationships and a plethora of tools like our programmatic biological opinions and kind of a creative intertwining of both. So going forward, relationships, good tools like programmatics and creativity, I think will help us be responsive to the fires and then help with restoration afterwards. Any questions? Thank you, Terry. And um, I'd like to invite everybody back onto the screen, all the presenters back onto the screen at this point, if anyone is still around. Um, and yeah, first, uh, just questions, if anyone has them online for Terry and for Catherine. We do have one question so far. This is for Catherine. Do the warnings reach all the affected populations and are there language and economic barriers to overcome? Um, no and yes. Uh, so, uh, like with any type of warning dissemination, it, it's particularly in the west and the mountainous areas, NOAA weather radio doesn't reach everywhere. A lot of our rural communities have, you know, varying levels of internet connectivity or cell phone coverage. So, with WIA, the wireless emergency alerts that, that ping on people's cell phones, there's an improvement there. Um, but they, there still are communities that are in affected areas that have a hard time getting our warnings when they're issued. Um, language, that is also a barrier. We've put out some outreach materials in different languages. Um, and, and I would defer probably to Megan and Scott who know, know more about how our, our warnings are disseminated on that side. But for post-fire, we have made an effort to do some outreach, um, in, at least in Spanish, some of the key affected areas. Um, there were large Spanish-speaking populations, but um, it's always a place that we can do better, in my opinion. Yeah, I can just piggyback off of that, Catherine. There, I think Troy showed it in his first slides of all the different ways um, that are used to disseminate. And so there's been a lot of efforts to translate into into Spanish our different types of warnings and there's a team in the weather service that has been working really hard to to do that and there's lots of ways people can get the warnings as well um, I think uh, Troy mentioned weather radios and your cell phone local media there's lots of different ways like that thanks Catherine um, another question this is for Terry can you share how restoration work to protect salmon can also help protect communities from debris flows? Ooh, this might be a dual question, actually. Hmm. Well, the immediate response that's happening right now is um, a lot of trees have been removed. And so some of the trees are being sold for timber and other trees are being retained for restoration efforts in the riparian areas and in the, in the streams. So getting out there and uh, getting seed down and getting some sedimentation barriers there, it's definitely gonna protect the rivers. And as we are looking at the communities, there are a number of communities that are right adjacent to the rivers. And so looking at when they start rebuilding, what they can do in the community to think about fire safety, to think about, you know, building in the riparian areas and how to 
um, do long-term restoration and tree plantings or shrub plantings or whatever within the communities that are being rebuilt, I think is one way to do restoration. Thanks, Terry. Another follow-up question with that. Um, do you follow up with uh, formal consultations once the urgency is over? Well, with the uh, emergency consultations, usually people call up and say, hey, we have an emergency and we, um, as possible, we work with them during the emergency. And then uh, there has been a request afterwards to follow up and that's what's supposed to happen. Um, it's generally not advantageous for the fish or any of the resources post fire, but it is a way for us to document what has happened. We shifted to utilizing existing programmatics so that we can respond now with some guidance and then also not have to follow up with emer emergency consultation because that takes a lot of time and energy after the fact. So we shifted to the programmatics to get people what they need now instead of after the fact. All right, and a couple other questions here. Have there been studies of intensity of fire in private harvested timberlands versus the federal land management timberlands? I think that might be what happened. Can you repeat that question, Megan? Sure. Have there been studies of the intensity of fire in private, privately harvested timberlands versus the federal land management timberlands? Oh, that specifically, I, I don't know between private and federally managed lands. There is a lot of research on, on fire intensity. There's the monitoring trends and in, in burn severity website. I think it's MTES. And, and so over the years, they, they've collected the, um, I think it's mostly the satellite estimates, but also some final soil burn severity maps. Um, and so there's a lot of studies going on about what, you know, what types of forest management practices might lead to a reduction in burn severity. There's a lot of anecdotal information, but specifically looking at the difference between private and federal, that I don't know. And I'll just follow up on that. That is one of the things that is currently being looked at um, in some of the briefings with some of the state directors. Uh, they have started with their assessments and they're seeing that um, the private land that has the uh, their practices to clear cut and then intensively plant and then clear cut and then intensively plant, that those actually burn hotter and faster than the federally managed land, which is usually significantly more um, natural areas with some plantations that may be thinned or harvested. So it is absolutely something that we are interested in learning more about. And if there is access to private lands to gain that information, it would be great because we are gonna have a lot of pressure to consider doing forestry differently or you know, doing biological opinions that support different ways of doing forestry. So definitely something that we wanna learn more about. Great, thank you so much, Terry and Catherine. And then uh, last question so far, for recent fires in the Colorado mountains, will the flooding occur with the spring snowmelt? Or will the soil be able to absorb the slower snowmelt? Great question. Uh, not an easy answer. Um, typically, we're, it, it's intense rainfall that causes the most problems. So um, if you're along the coast, the west coast, it's atmospheric rivers carrying you know, embedded convection thunderstorms. If you're interior in the west, it's often the summer convection. Um, spring snowmelt flooding in my experience, it, it's not as much of a risk. Um, partly the soil, when it's water repellent, that, that repellency, it's, and, and I'm talking a little outside my lengths, I'm not a soil scientist, but as it's been to explain to me, that water repellency kind of goes away during the winter time and comes back in the summer. So there's, the soils are a little more able to um, take in some moisture in the winter time and with the spring runoff. And just the, the rate of runoff with a spring snowmelt versus an intense rainfall event are very different. 
but what has what I have seen is just the amount of erosion from a spring snow melt or a rain on snow event in a burned area can be pretty significant and problematic because it can plug culverts, cause highways to fail from that mechanism, just from the erosion and sedimentation, um, rather than just a, a generic like flash flood or big flood event. So it's it's not a simple answer. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. And then what are the biggest potential technical and data challenges with post-fire debris flow risk modeling? The biggest challenge is not having a database that has event data for the entire western U.S. or, you know, now we're looking potentially Alaska, Southeast, et cetera. So they've done a lot of research in Southern California. They have a great, their model is really calibrated very, very well to that area because they've been doing research there for decades. So we are working very closely with USGS to develop kind of an event, non-event data collection um, platform to fill in those data gaps for the rest of the US because it, it's variable. You know, what causes a debris flow in Southern California is not what causes a debris flow in Northern California if that landscape is even prone to it. So there's just, just data of events happening or not happening is kind of the biggest challenge. Um, on the science and research side, once folks have that data, they, I mean, there's so much good science happening in that area that really it's just getting the data to them to improve those models. And also I would say the next, the next leap is having the inundation debris flow models, which they are working on. Um, we're not quite there yet, but knowing what the probability of a debris flow is one thing, but knowing what it might impact if it happens is the next leap. We don't really have that yet. Um, and, and that's what really what would drive a lot of that more targeted public outreach or evacuations and emergency response activity. Thanks, Catherine. And another follow-up, uh, this is for Terry. Um, I don't know if I'm going to say this word right. How do fire events impact anadromous fish passage issues such as blocked culverts or sediment filling streams and uh, channeling flow depth? Uh, how does it affect anadromous fish? So sedimentation in the streams, um, debris flow, and um, removal of trees from riparian areas that provide shade. Um, that, so without the shade, there's increased temperature. So there's a myriad of potential effects to anadromous fish. So it depends on, depends on when the fire is, what happens afterwards, and uh, which fish are there when. So, you know, a plethora of, <laughs> of impacts to fish just depends on, on burn severity and any response and you know status of the species. Thanks, Terry. I don't have any more questions right now. Thank you, Megan, and thanks um, everyone who attended and all the presenters today. They all came together on really short notice to put together this really fantastic set of presentations about um, the wildfires this year. So um, with that, I'll end. We're, we're bumping up towards the, or we're past the end of when I wanted to shut off the presentation. But I'm really, um, really thankful for all of you guys joining us today. I'll post this presentation on our Google site, and then I'm, I may work with someone to get it onto YouTube as well. Um, and then I'm going to send this out later with um, some additional information on the Google site to um, to link to some of the presentations and resources that people um, raised today during um, during this session. So thank you everyone and um, enjoy your day and have a happy Thanksgiving soon. <laughs>